Hi, my name is Dr. Lesha Vashuk, and I'm the Compliance and Education Specialist at Prep Doctors. And today I'm going to be speaking with our guest, Ms. Lisa Philp of Transitions Group. And we'll be talking about the Dental Practice Essentials course, which I'm really excited about. And uh, I'm going to talk with Lisa a bit about what I'm particularly looking forward to hearing about as she joins us in the uh, amongst the teachers of that course. So, um, Lisa, welcome to Prep Doctors. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. So, you know, I, I heard so many good things about Prep Doctors before I came to work here that that I um, somehow had a feeling that I would find a role that, that really suited um, my personality and the skills that I've developed in my career before I came here. Uh, and in fact, I have. And so I'm really looking forward to teaching in the Dental Practice Essentials course and sharing what I learned from my role at the Dental Regulatory Authority, where I spoke with thousands of dentists yes. over the 16 years that I was on the phones there. And, you know, they called us for all sorts of different reasons. And a lot of the reasons related to the relationships that they had with the other staff in the dental office, the relationships that um, they had with other dentists, both right. within and outside the office, uh, the relationships with patients. Um, you know, I think that, that learning how to get along in the dental office environment is something that you only begin to learn once you get out there. But, Absolutely. but I think the communication skills can be learned and taught. And I'm really looking forward to what you're going to bring to our Dental Practice Essentials course, yes. which, which touches on all of those things uh, and talks about how a new dentist can find the right place for them. Yes, it's very, very important. I think the exciting part about joining an already existing great mm -hmm. course with content, knowledge, and information to prepare them is we can also, we will be doing together some interaction so they can practice in a safe environment so they can apply it um, mm -hmm. as they learn it and use tangible things that match today's market. Not only post-COVID, but what's going on uh, in dentistry today. So, you know, our audience isn't going to be um, necessarily familiar with what you've done in your career. I mean, I, you know, I, I knew yeah. about you also <laughs> before I met you. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you've done in dentistry. Sure. I, uh, dental hygienist by education 30 years ago. Um, practiced chair side for 10 years and then evolved into doing hygiene programs uh, in the early 2000s and had an opportunity through doing hygiene programs with an existing uh, consulting company to take on the leadership and the entrepreneurship of uh, expanding how we can help dentistry with their uh, with all the things they don't learn in dental school. The human capital, as you say, it's a human capital business. Like you, we have a lot in common. We've talked to a lot of dentists <laughs> over the decades. And by that, um, with our commitment to help them be better. Um, also, but help them understand that dentistry is one part of it. And 99% of dentists 30 years later still tell me, I just want to be a dentist. What about all the other things? And I said, the other things are going to be critical. You're a business owner, an entrepreneur, the leader. Um, I mean, you manage all of the team, the team, the operations, the patient experience, the patient satisfaction, down to the technical procedures, the equipment, the technology. It is impossible today for a dentist to do it all. So we really work on how do we get a dentist to do what only a dentist can do and leverage all the other facets so that we can build a circle of success around their technical giftedness. And, and I think that you know, these are skills, as you've said, they're not taught in dental school. And, and new dentists who are in practice as associates, or maybe they're working someplace, you know, in some other institution and so on, they can learn these skills. They can take on some of the, those roles from the principal or from the, uh, the director. I think that they can prepare for a future as an entrepreneur. Right, and I think there's probably two pieces to that. First uh -huh. of all is how do you prepare and stand apart from the competition of uh -huh. the thousands of de new dentists coming into this country every year. Right. Um, with knowing more than just about how to work on speed and skill of a procedure. Mm -hmm. It sets them apart to be chosen. Another part of it is, um, you know, dental grads often come out thinking and being told they know what they, everything that they need to know. And I often say to them, how about we learn, how about you get in touch 
with learning what you don't know mm -hmm. because there's many other places to that but also how to make that how to set themselves up for success so how to get selected but also how to get selected for the position that's the right fit but also when they're in that position them coming with a deeper understanding of all of the operational side it's very difficult for an owner uh, or for an existing dentist to train on the job with a new associate because a new associate's generally coming on not as a student they're coming on as a provider Right. to meet a need, whether it's an excess patient flow, whether it's our coverage of hours that the principal doesn't want to do. So I find the training by accident that happens day to day can be quite stressful for a new associate. And a lot of associateships get a bad rap because they didn't work out. But it's not because they failed, it's just I believe they didn't prepare and strategize properly of how to work through the, the first year, the second year, of how to integrate a new relationship into a human capital business of patient goodwill, team credibility, and the ownership not being threatened by bringing in another dentist. So, if we were to talk about um, how a new dentist could strategize their own professional development so they can enter the job market and then <coughs> make that good first impression and also contribute to the team, meet the needs of well, the I principal. Think, you know, in my experience, it's, let's think of it in three layers, right? So, first thing is they need to know themselves self-awareness, what their gifts are, what their strengths are, what they're already good at so they can maximize those and also put a learning process together of what they don't know mm -hmm. and how they can learn it incrementally over time. That's understanding ourselves. Right? I, always, I often say, my, how you've changed since I've changed, mm -hmm. right? So knowing, your set, knowing themselves is a really big part of this. And even with whether it's an international dentist or it's a, a Canadian graduate dentist, knowing who they are as a person behaviorally is mm -hmm. what I call this. A lot of people refer to them as the soft skills, but the better I know myself, the easier I'm going to be able to connect. The second part of that is how, we work, how they work with others because there's this is team sport <laughs> it's a team it's a team environment so how do they show up with others does their intention meet their impact and how do they how do they not not just lead others but how you know sometimes a dentist said to me they've never had a dental assistant before right or they're they're going to have someone sit with a knee to knee every hour they're providing procedures well that's just not something that happens by accident taking the time to plan out expectations with that person who's going to and treating people like they're equal because we need every in a dental practice we all need each other right it takes a team approach and then i think the third level is is really what is the what is the results that they want to get and you know it's interesting um, setting goals and writing goals is one of the most effective I mean, we've known this for for a hundred years in, in any kind of business or any kind of education program and it's interesting taking the time to write goals and planning out a strategy towards a vision um, is going to have bigger impact than just hoping it happens. Hope is not a strategy in dentistry today. Success by accident, the days when I first started where you put up a sign, field of dreams, you call your parents, they call the church, they call the congregation, they call the family, and everyone just comes in droves is long, long gone. So I think a big part of it is what are the results? If I know myself, I know how I show up with others, what are the results that I want to achieve? And 3% of the uh, pro profession, 3% of the people in dentistry that write their goals contribute to 97% of the success and the wealth. It's fascinating. You know, mm -hmm. people ask me all the time, why don't more people write their goals? I said, I, really the number one reason is fear of failure. We're afraid if we write our goal and we hold ourselves accountable and we don't meet it, it's going to impact our self-worth or our self-esteem. But I think if in a, but I think any kind of any kind of person or business that wants to be 1% better tomorrow. The biggest disease in dentistry that gets in the way is perfectionism, mm -hmm. right? And you think about it, perfectionists are often quite unhappy most of the time because they're searching for something that doesn't exist. So when a dentist says, I want a perfect associate, I go, I said, Dude, that's like asking for a perfect wife or a perfect child or a perfect patient. So if really, if they said, well, how can I be, if they, really, if they got up every day and said, how could I be 1% better today than I was yesterday? progress versus perfection is going to be how they connect better with others and they learn more about themselves. So how can somebody measure progress in the soft skills or assess themselves as to where their starting point is for improvement? 
Great question. As a dentist, you mean? How can they measure that? Yeah. yeah. In a dental practice environment and specifically the dentist role. Yeah. Well, I think the first place starts with how are they connecting with the dental team? Because <clears throat> a dentist can do all the diagnosis and all the treatment planning, but when they leave the room in the white coat, the patient looks right at the team member and says, so, would you do this? Are they any good? Mm -hmm. How new are they? Right? They ask the dental team. So I think they can measure success in how the dental team is advocating for them in a position. Mm -hmm. That is a huge win and a big sign of how they're showing up internally. The next, with the patient, I think the patient's feedback, the patient reviews, and also when a patient says yes, with a smile on their face, agreeing to compensate us more than it costs us to serve them, that's a win. Right. So they look at their, their key areas are case acceptance, mm -hmm. right? Case acceptance. Uh, team synergy <clears throat> and um, is their schedule full when an associate comes in and they're doing a great job in the human capital soft size of it meaning they're taking time to listen to the people who've been in this environment they show up you know they show up for a daily strategy meeting so that the team can tell them about this 20-year patient to give them insight before they walk in to work in one of the top two most intimate zones of their body it's critical in their daily preparation okay. So I think it's measuring it, not just by money. You put the people first, the money comes in dentistry. That's what the wonderful things about it. And I like what you say um, that really how full an associate schedule is does depend a lot on the associate. How they um, well, get they along with the take, staff, yes. whether the staff have confidence in their abilities. So what can a, a new dentist do to promote those things? Like well, in terms of specific actions, if we were to teach them some communication skills or strategies, what might you suggest? Well, I think if I was in, so this, a new associate being selected for a position, the first thing I would do is ask if I could meet the people that have built this practice for however many decades before mm -hmm. I get here so we can show credit, respect for their past. Mm -hmm. Let them know that you're here. Let them know that I'm here. If I was the associate, let them know that I'm here to adapt. Here's where I come from. Here's what's important to me. Now tell me what's important to you of how you'd like to work best together. A lot of it's in the preparation. Mm -hmm. You know, you think about it. A team comes in on Monday and the owner says, hi, we've got a new associate. We picked one. And everyone's looking like the sun's in their eyes going, great. <laughs> like, who are you? And why you right right and if we if they really just started with expect managing expectations what is the role like a lot of associates uh when they call me and say it didn't work out i say well what were the expectations when you began they go i don't know just to like do dentistry i said well that's a that's an automatic expectation you wouldn't be hired if, if it wasn't for that so managing the expectations with the owner what mm -hmm. kind of procedures, how's it gonna work with new patients, with patients of records, how are we going to introduce the new associate, are they gonna be on our website, right? Those kinds of things with the owner, with the principal, and then meeting with the team and sharing from authenticity, this is where this is where the this is who I am. This is where I come from. I'm here to respect all of the great things you've built here. Please keep the chain of communication open. Mm -hmm. And then I think while they're in the position is to keep in regular communication. You know, when when dental teams have uh, team meetings and they say the associate didn't show up, I go, what? What do you mean they didn't show up? Well, they don't get paid for it. I go. The time in 30 minutes to show up for a team meeting is a 10x numerical <laughs> result if you really were going to measure a behavior mm -hmm. versus financial or financial or results when it comes to, to, to being successful. A lot of it is just keeping the, the lines of communication and you know I often say to new associates go in and be curious. Go into curiosity mode. Not into you know it all. Yes you've been bombarded with brilliance IQ tests and passing things and you you are a dentist well now what when I say now what is now you build the people right that's the quantitative the, the the left side the right side is how do I communicate how do I connect how do I build trust and when a dental team trusts an associate because they take the time to be interested and curious curiosity mode is you ask before you tell Right, so I would say, you know, to, to the dental team, what is important to you that I could do to make your job better here? Dental team members go, wow. 
<laughs> the principals never even asked me that, <laughs> right? So it's really put, you put, putting the people first, and it starts with the employees. It starts with the team. I don't call them staff, uh, but because the, a, a high-performing team of dentists will make or break an associate. Yeah, I have no doubt. Um, a new associate um, in today's market may be expected to do all sorts of procedures that uh, maybe even the principal doesn't do. Right. So technical expertise, the scientific knowledge, um, the fact that the new dental curriculum is different than it was, you know, maybe when the principal graduated. These are all things. But the dentist, the new dentist may need support, may need some confidence building. Right. Well, if you think of where does trust come from, mm -hmm. especially in our country, with Canadians have a long convincer strategy on trust. You, they don't just trust you automatically because you showed up and you have a degree. So okay. trust comes from competence. They uh -huh. need to, people need to believe we're competent right. in what we're doing and our confidence. And you know, I often tell new dentists, fake it till you feel it sometimes. <laughs> Meaning, you always know more, you always go in with a confidence level, maybe a little higher than you feel at the time. You gain experience and then it becomes real. I don't mean go in and be fake, don't hear it that way. I'm all about authenticity. Right. But sometimes, you know, um, self-worth and how we feel about ourselves and how we speak about ourselves shows our confidence level. Doesn't mean you go in and bang your chest and say I'm the best when I've never done a patient before outside of dental school, but you let them know you want to build your confidence in your skill, but also confidence in how the, the place that they're working operates. Trust also comes from um, cooperation. Mm -hmm. And if associates could just every opportunity they have to attend learning, learning on this part of it, Anyone right. can take courses, but um, attend learning, att um, show cooperation with the people that they're working with every day. The trust comes. The goal setting and the procedures and, you know, I want to learn how to do an implant because I never did one in, in the school that I was at. That's all part of the goal setting for the technical side of it. And that's where, you know, if more associates went to the principal and said, I would really value a mentor. Mm -hmm. And they would do, we set, what we do is we set up, um, we set up the principal and the associate for joint treatment planning in the first 90 days. So they look at cases. They sit as professional colleagues and say, okay, here's the case I got. The associate in, in their humility mm -hmm. doesn't be afraid to ask what they don't know. They say, I, I believe I know this. This is what I was thinking. And they can collaborate in treatment plannings that treatment planning processes because you could take one patient and 10 dentists and I've seen 10 different treatment plans, right? right? A big part of diagnostic consistency is that last piece of trust, right? So that the team doesn't see one dentist comes in and diagnoses A, another, the associate comes in, diagnoses B, and then they're, they're left with the patient going, which one's right or wrong? Often it's not about right or wrong. It's just about what's, what's the provider comfortably and delivering but working with the principal on joint treatment planning and then also taking some down t taking time when they're not producing to watch the principal oh that's an amazing idea because the biggest goal of a new associate is their speed and skill when it comes to procedures mm -hmm. right the people part of this side is their speed and skill right you don't get four hours to do a crown prep with three impressions if it's not perfect right it's so getting their speed and skill up and if you think about it, the principal and owner is doing all of these procedures, uh, doing their own procedures. Why not take some time and take interest and just ask them to talk out loud what's, what's going on in their head as they're doing this procedure? The learning from that is amazing. Right. Um, I think also uh, an untapped resource really are the experienced dental assistants in the office, you know, in <laughs> terms of learning how to do forehanded dentistry. It's, it's very often, yes. um, an associate will be essentially trained by the dental assistant, and then later in their career, they'll be training dental assistants. But I think that the tips... Well, if they come in with an open mind, yeah. if, especially if you've got a veteran dental assistant yeah. who's been sitting chairside doing this for a lot of years, she's your number one person to value. Right. Because even a year after dentistry, I've never seen a dentist that says, I don't need a dental assistant ever. That's one thing I can say 100% consistently, right? right? So they can, and, 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 and involving the dental assistant um, and giving the dental assistant the opening that you're not above them, right. that you're in this together, which is great for the patients. The patients love to see uh, healthy communication between their providers. Mm -hmm. They listen and watch everything. Even if you put headphones on, sometimes they'll turn them down just to see what's going on above them while they lay flat on their back. 
So I think it's an open mind. If there's a better way that you see that I can do this, can we debrief after this appointment? Not in front of the patient. Right, I wouldn't of say, course. you know, doctor, doctor, baby doctor, please, you did this wrong. You would never do that in front of the patient. Mm -hmm. But be being able to debrief and getting the dental assistant's feedback, how do you think that worked? And I've seen dental assistants say, you know, I have seen someone use this instrument. Why don't you try this? Or there is this product that might make that faster for you. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, asking the dental assistant, telling them the goal is to get speed and skill, not to be fast. Right. To be efficient. And then sitting, you know, looking at the week, saying, where did we run on time? Where did I run behind? And getting their feedback. I think those are excellent tips. Now, I've actually, when I was in practice, have uh, had some dental assistants actually say, would you like this doctor? Yes. <laughs> Trying the to assertive give you a little ones. Hint. Yes. Um, but, but I like your approach because then... Well, not everyone, not every dental assistant. Of course. And, and right now we've got to value our dental assistants. There's uh, never been mm -hmm. a shortage of dental assistants like there has been in this country. Mm -hmm. So if we give them job fulfillment, we make them feel, I mean, people want to be uh, involved and they want to be, uh, and they want to interact in their own position not just sit there in silence with a saliva ejector, right? right? So I think the key is setting the stage that as a dentist, I have an open mind for any of your suggestions. It doesn't mean I need to accept them all. Right. It just means I'm open to your suggestions because not every dental assistant would have the confidence that you, you had with the one you worked with that mm -hmm. would suggest proactively and assertively something. Right. And I think getting rid of this hierarchy that the dentist is, the dentist is up here and the assistant's down here, mm -hmm. arrogance ruins associateships and arrogance is a belief that we know everything and we're above someone that's there to help us if we come in and we say what's our mutual exchange of that mutual exchange of value we're in this together it works better so I wanted to talk a little bit about what may appear to be arrogance sometimes is insecurity right and in my experience um, dental assistants I mean they know very well that we're the dentists I mean they know that we're the doctors and yeah. some and sometimes uh, depending on when they graduated they may actually have a very hard time calling us by our first names when the patient isn't there right so they may say doctor automatically but I think truly they understand what we bring as dentists yes and they because every member of the dental team uh, the oral health care team is committed to patient care you know, um, I think that they would really appreciate being heard from and, and being listened to. They will excel. Yeah, I think so. They will excel and to a point where some assistants say, I like to work with the new doctor. Can I stay with, uh -huh. <laughs> with them, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> because, and I said, so what's, what's different? You've been here yeah. a long time. They say, because we plan together, we're, we do it together. Right, um, but I, I guess what I was yeah. trying to, to sort of get to is that sometimes dentists, new dentists, will feel, um, they'll be afraid to admit that they don't know something whether to the assistants that they're working yeah. with or to the principal because they, they, they really want that opportunity and they're afraid. So how do you do it in a way that, that comes across as strong and confident but at the same time does admit that there are some areas for improvement? Great question. I think humility is another p piece of trust, uh -huh. being able to show humility. But I think for me to be humble, uh -huh. humble and kind. I always say just be humble and kind and the rest will work itself out. Right. So humble though is knowing what you're good at before you talk about all the things you're not good at. Mm -hmm. Right. So being very clear, what being clear, this is what I feel like I'm really good at. If you have a different opinion, please feel free to give it to me. Uh -huh. Here's what I'd like to learn because I don't know what I don't know yet and I look forward to learning it with you together mm -hmm. is a place of humility and the fear of not knowing I mean de I've been dentistry three decades there every day there it's different every day there's something that someone might not know but we learn it together and in fact that's actually what makes it exciting being in a profession and being in this sphere right in the dental sector um, it's always changing. There's always something new to learn. If we knew everything right. and had to do the same thing every day the same way, it would be so boring. Right. Come on. I mean, I think this is really a, a Great plus. point. And you know, in the, on the humility side of it is as a, as a new associate saying, here's what I feel like I've mastered. Mm -hmm. Here's my learning goals of what I want to learn in the next three months, six months, nine months. People will be attracted to you to want to help you. Right, so I was thinking of last week, there was a new associate, he came in, went through all the procedures he felt like he's mastered, took some extra hands-on courses, and his goal was to learn how to use soft tissue laser because there was one in the practice, and 
I said, before the assistant hands you the soft tissue laser, you can't not tell her you've never <laughs> used one before. So be proactive and say soft tissue laser, for example, because they use, used mm -hmm. it there. And he said, it's amazing. Once I did that, she she could teach me how to use it better than I, <laughs> better right. than I can. I said, well, she's like your guide. She's been with someone using it for a long time. So once they know that you're open to learning something new or better or different, they say when when the student's ready, the teacher will appear. The teacher can be many different facet, many different members of the team. Right. So let's talk about the front desk. Right. We've talked a lot about the dental assistant. The business office, yes. And and well, maybe um, this is older terminology. I was thinking front desk, back office. Yeah. But but in terms so of I the have administrative a joke. I roles. say front desk is a piece of furniture. So that's why I call them the business <laughs> office. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so so let's talk about yeah those team members that that fulfill administrative roles that yeah. that um, not clinical roles. Yes. What can they teach a new dentist? There's probably there's 18 key systems in the playbook mm -hmm. in an administrative office that keeps a dentist productive. From the patient, from the new patient experience, new patient experience and setting the patient up, to the scheduling, uh, to the time management, to the check-in, to the check-out, to keeping patients retained, to checking in with patients of how they feel about our dental practice with their loyalty. Um, so the administrative team is key. Without an administrative team, there would be there wouldn't be productive schedules. Um, also, building relationship with the administrative team on listening to how they speak to patients on the, fo on the phone. What are their modes of communication? Are they using email? Are they using texting? Because an administrative team that has built to contribute to a successful practice that's ready for an associate has built one or two dentists before. They're going to now build this associate again. So it's building rapport with them and relationship and showing they're valued. One of the biggest things over the years in dentistry is the front against the back. Oh, tell me about that. Oh, it's like a Red Rover game. Did you ever play? I'm showing my age, but did you ever play a Red Rover game on the I playground? Have. There's a lot of damage done in that game. <laughs> right. But I, I'm fascinated by this concept. Yes. And I mean, the front, there, it, it's not a contest between the front and the back, is when you bring the front and the back together, you have the, the clinical team doing the best they can to support. You know, I often say there's, there's certain questions that sh should never be have question when a patient arrives at, a, at the business office is what was done today with who for how much what's next with who and for how long and oftentimes if the back isn't contributing in the flow of the patient to the front then there can be a breakdown in the ch checkout collections the, the financial payments and misunderstanding patients mm -hmm. don't like to be surprised right so it's very very important for the clinic and um, also with the front is the front seeing the clinic as if they're not there to do their job then there's not much for me to do as an administrative member and how do we you know it's interesting the most productive 10 minutes of every day in dentistry is for us all to come together the clinical team and the admin team to review our day in dentistry and not look at it at silos mm -hmm. is to look across the schedule and say how can we all be in this together and when you look and you see how many places a dentist has to divide their body into in one hour, they have to be producing 60 cents on every dollar in the restorative department with one to two interruptions an hour in hygiene to have something to do next month. That often is a challenge for an associate to get used to that flow. Right. But, you know, when dentists, dentists still don't like hygiene exams, I go, well, you cannot like them, but that's what feeds you. <laughs> on patients of record. So it's really the, the 10 minutes to prepare for the day, practices that just get together and practice for the day have a quantitative result of growth of 10% with no change. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's 30 years of backup. Right. So um, let's talk about uh, back to the course, dental practice. Yes. Dental. And so how to find the right fit? What does the new dentist who's entering the job market need to have in terms of I don't know what 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 should they highlight on the resume? What what do you give advice when you're advising yeah. your clients? Well, what do they look for? They first of all, it's an it's in modern times, they look for a digital footprint. No matter who I tell a name mm -hmm. of an associate to, what's every what are what do all humans do now? <laughs> right. They look for this person on the internet. So a digital footprint consists of what's your what's your presence visually? We need to see what you look like. Whether you like how you look, it really doesn't matter. We need mm. to see, there needs to be a visual presence with high, high resolution photos. 
right? Not a picture on the boat, <laughs> right? Okay. That's a different context. But also um, is with their LinkedIn profile. And LinkedIn is a very effective profile uh, social media platform in dentistry because it's called B2B, business to business. Mm -hmm. And really, what is? how do I show up on a LinkedIn profile? I'm, I'm so surprised when I get all these resumes from associates and I go to research them before we interview them and I can't find them. Mm -hmm. And I've even sent texts to one, I can't find you anywhere on the internet, can you send me a picture? And then I tell them how handsome they are, why do they not have a profile? <laughs> it would do them a lot of good. So I think setting up a, a visual, credentials, all credentials, and you know, sometimes new dentists say, I don't have any credentials. Yes, you do. There's things you did to get into undergrad. There's things you did in your teenage years. And it's starting your career with credentials, meaning what is it you gave back to people? Mm -hmm. What is it you might have done in the community? Right? And what is it your mission is? What is it? Why, why, are, why are they a good dentist? Why are they who they are? And oftentimes with international, I say, tell your story of how you arrived in Canada. It's a beautiful story. It's not about you have been a dentist somewhere else and now you deserve to be a dentist now that's people that's a given but what's the story of how you arrived in our country more with the international but even with um, dentists that that graduate from Canadian schools how did you arrive at the school that you were chosen at and what is it what is your goals and aspiration and purpose that you want to achieve as a dentist for the next 10 or 20 years also um, I think, well, really, I think I've covered it all. There's the, the credentials, the education, there's the, the personal side of it, what's important to me, what is my aspir knowing Knowing why I became a dentist is pretty critical in the first two years. Right. Patients even ask, so why did you become a dentist? Right. Or why did you leave your country? Right. And having that answer on the internet, but also having it verbally too, that you can follow through with. Um, also, networking is huge, and I, I find networking um, and I'm a big networker just because I've been around for so long and I'm still here and people say, wow, you're still here. I said, yeah, I'm here because until dentists are learnt, taught this in dental school, I'll always have a job. Right. Um, but I think it's, there's the industry, there's sales professionals, there's other colleagues, there's students they went to school with, there's joining study clubs. There is a plethora of groups uh, that a, a new dentist can join and be part of. And it, we're better together than we are apart. You know, when people ask me, what do you love about COVID besides all the negative stuff is I love that I've never in 30 years seen Canadian dentistry band together. Hence how I met you, how I met Faraz, like, right? It's, and, and got involved in prep doctors never together, never before have I seen dentistry band together because the shock of dentistry being sent to their basement so they could freak out. And that's their words. That's not mine. Uh -huh. It was, whether people call it a reset or a life altering event. Mm -hmm. Um, they realize we can't, I can't do it alone. Right. We're all in this together. And when dentist wins, we all, when dentistry wins, we all win. So I, I want to talk about, yes, there's competition because <laughs> there are a lot of dentists out there. Yeah. But every dentist needs their own network and, 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 and group of, of, I guess, supportive um, colleagues across the industry. Right. And Profession in the industry. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, there's also this whole idea of what's good for the profession, right? So, um, but I wanna talk about right fit because I mean, honestly, all my career, if there are the colleagues that do the kind of work that I do, there are colleagues that do completely different kinds of work. Yeah. There are people who are like me in personality, not, per not like me. And I really have um, believe in, if, if, it's the, if it's not the right fit for you, it may be the right fit for somebody else. Oh yes, I've seen. And, and if you can suggest somebody who you know to be a good dentist, different from you, maybe it's the right fit, or if it's you can't do this job, but yet I know somebody who does the kind of work that I do, um, because you're so busy, ha. Huh? See, there the thing is, you found the right associate ship, and now somebody else comes calling because you've built your network successfully. Well, I can't do it, but I think networking involves helping other people. Yes. It's not just about your own benefit. And when you help other people, as you're growing your network, yeah. they will think of you in future. Yes, and and as being a networker, it's always how can I how can I serve you? Yeah. How can we come up with a mutual aligned exchange? Yeah. I do this all the time, not to be annoying. Mutual sure. exchange of value, so it's win win for both of us. Uh -huh. And there's nothing I would ever ask of a network as a new dentist until I gave. Thank you, and that's exact. I wanted to make that point because otherwise that's considered 
using or not authentic or uh -huh. not the right integrity. Right. But you give before you ask. Yeah. And and once people see you giving, then they will be... Reciprocation. It's the yeah. law of human... Especially yeah, Canada, yeah. Canadians are the law of reciprocation. Right. Right? Whether you believe in karma and mm -hmm. all good things come back to you, that might be a little conceptual for some people, but mm -hmm. the law of reciprocation is very valid and very true, not only with the profession, the industry, but that's how patients stay loyal. Mm -hmm. Right? They reciprocate. If we, we just take the time to make sure that we're both exchanging equal value. So I want to talk about patient reciprocation a little bit if I can because in my mind there's two things I mean they're they'll they'll be willing to accept your recommendations on trust they will be willing to give you the benefit of the doubt because they know that you're you you're considering them like what I'm saying is okay dentistry you're not gonna be perfect we talked about perfectionism so let's say there's a miscommunication if you've built the trust with patient if you've served the patient conscientiously they'll be more likely to give you that benefit and come back and ask you the question rather than posting a negative review. Yes. Right? So there's a bit of this reciprocity there. Uh, there's also the um, reciprocity in terms of recommending you to their family, bringing yeah. their family Referral. in. Referral, yeah. Recommending you to their colleagues at work, their neighbors, you name it. Um, you know, I, you're making me go back to my, my favorite mantra um, by uh, Patch Adams, one of my favorite healthcare professionals that I studied for a lot of years. You treat a disease, you win, you lose. You treat a person, you win every time, no matter what the outcome. Mm -hmm. So dentists are so focused on going to the hole in the center of the face, looking at 28 white things, saying you have to, you need, you should. This is, and this is how much it costs, and this is what I think you should do. Whereas Canadian patients want to be heard before they're talked to and I call it the model of dentistry for years was show, was show up and throw up excuse all my Lisa isms but I'm doing this <laughs> a lot you know they, they put mm -hmm. someone flat on their back they'd walk in sometimes they don't even know their name and they go hi and they'd show up and throw up all their brilliance and intellect in a code language of jargon that patients don't understand you need two PBMs an RCT and four ATs with an RE mm -hmm. and the good news is that's five thousand dollars and they're all like this so they want to understand and it's hard for a high left brain IQ brilliant because dentistry doesn't lack brilliance mm -hmm. to go down to a level of lay terms mm -hmm. when they're communicating but also you know what came back in the, the study of the patient satisfaction from the Canadian Dental Association a common theme through everything of what's your perception of a good dentist and what's your expectation of a good dentist because that's what satisfaction is right is empathy the patients want to know you took the time to get to know me and my life and my movie before you tell me what you think I should do or I need to do. Right. So that's often interviewing skills, asking great questions. Tell me about your dental history so far. Sally and the dental team in our preparation meeting today shared with me you've been a patient here for 20 years. I've looked at your chart. Tell me, where do you see yourself in the next five? And let them talk. Mm -hmm. I often say, let's go from us 80% talking to show how smart we are and them 20% listening and reverse it, right? So ask before you tell and also get to know something about that patient so they feel like you have the right to, to suggest things that they have either heard before and not said yes to or that are new solutions to problems. So as a patient, I really, I don't like jumping around from office to office. I, I like these long... They want to stay loyal. They're yeah. Dying for you to earn their loyalty, <laughs> really, is my experience. Right. Um, and, and I don't think that, that, you know, the right fit for a patient, the right fit for the patient is where they feel valued as a person. Absolutely. Really. It's a human capital business. Yeah. Um, so can you tell me a little bit more about this Canadian Dental Association uh, Survey? Yes. Yeah. So, so, yeah, we could talk in depth about that. Um, basically, the Canadian Dental Association, uh, a couple of years ago, before COVID, uh, did a survey to consumers, to mm -hmm. patients, on what do they perceive as a great dentist and what do they expect from a dentist. And when I say the common thing, uh, empathy was at the first part of mm -hmm. perception of a good dentist. Mm -hmm. Expectation of a good dentist was empathy, meaning, and empathy means you take the time to understand what it's like to walk in my shoes, not to wallow with me, not to feel sorry for me, right? but that you have an understanding of who I am before we talk about, before you talk about my health. Right. 